When the Western world sees food drops to the starving of Africa, we think it will never happen to us. But there's a man in Australia who says that that's where we're heading. I think if we could get Earth in a living and stable state, not a constantly degrading and dying state caused by our actions, then we have one sun right to go to the stars. But at present, uh, I don't think we'd be welcome anywhere else in the universe. You wouldn't welcome anybody who'd laid waste to the house and wanted to live in yours, I'm sure. Bill Mollison was born in Stanley, Tasmania. He has spent his life in the Australian wilderness, working, researching and exploring. Through it, he developed a deep understanding of nature, but it led him into conflict with the ideas of his generation. After protesting this and that since the 50s, I decided that opposition wouldn't work. So in 72, I walked away from society cut a hole in the bush, built a house in the barn, put in some plants, and decided I'd live separately from society. I think a lot of people have decided that it, throughout history, disgusted with humanity. It wasn't long, I think a matter of weeks, when I'd completed that process, that I, uh, I thought, well, am I going to sit here for the rest of my life and let, let the bastards roll over everything? And I thought, no, I'll go back and I'll fight. But then I, then I uh, spent a couple of years deciding on how I would fight. And I decided I wouldn't fight with, with conventional weapons of any sort, but I'd come back in with positivism and with a system. And uh, many of us have been defining what we didn't want. And I thought, well, it's time to define what we do want. And largely that turned out to be permaculture. <laughs> Bill Mollison is a busy man. Fifteen years ago, he thought up a way of saving the world. Now he spends his life promoting it. In 1982, he won fame when he was awarded the alternative Nobel Prize. And now permaculture takes him around the world. We're in Christchurch, New Zealand with National Radio. Bill, what I'd like to get first is what's the basic idea behind permaculture? Well, it's <clears throat> always been a system design of integrating uh, good housing to landscape, at least use of materials and least pollution output, conservation of natural resources. It's actually a very practical design system. How widespread is the movement around the world? Well, we teach in some 30 countries and probably a couple of hundred languages. But our graduates... Welcome. I'd like to quote Robin Francis. She says just exactly what I want to say. There is a major shift apparent in society at large. Awareness is, a rapidly, is rapidly growing in all sectors. Permaculture is a bit of everything. To some, it is architecture. To others, organic farming. Some say it is a philosophy and a way of life. Others believe it is their only hope. My name is uh, John Prakash Pereira, and I'm from India. Botswana is developing a permaculture extension centre. The reason I came on this trip was sort of a work study and sort of a vision quest. Badri Dahal is the name, and I come from the top of the world, Nepal. <laughs> I'm Bill Mollison from Tweed River in northern New South Wales. Australia, <clears throat> where we planted one and a half million trees last year. Um, I, um, as you know, I probably initiated this movement or whatever it is. Permaculture is a design system, but the engineering principles it follows are those of life. Earth evolved from dust and gas and bathed in the energy of a huge hydrogen furnace known as the sun. A living system powerful enough to colonize an entire planet was born.
Allison looked at this process and saw a model. Here was a system that was stable and fertile, yet became ever more complex. Its greatest expression is to be found in a forest system. These Antarctic beach forests are over a billion years old. They existed on Gondwana land, the land mass that was once Australia and South America. They have remained alive for so long because there are millions of species within them. This complexity makes them adaptable, but at the same time, highly productive. And that is how Mollison believes our own environment should be. We don't think of this as being stable in the sense of a concrete building or a concrete road. It's stable in the sense of a constant adjustment that's being made when we ride a bicycle. It has a dynamic stability. There are hundreds of thousands, millions of things to learn in here. This is not like some machine where we can screw on fittings or put wires between part of the system. Here we rely on a fungus uh, to do their job to make the connection. Therefore, if we lose the forests, we lose our only instructors. And people must see these forests and wilderness as the greatest educational system that we have on the planet. So we lose all the universities and we would lose nothing. But if we lose the forests, we lose everything. All political systems that I know of, and most kings, have moved the whole nation to desert. And uh, the things of which they are most proud, the cities and the canals and the irrigation and so on, are the things that killed their cultures. And it continues unabated. If people don't seize power back and make their own gardens and sit in their own gardens of Eden, then uh, we're all finished. And the whole world turned to dust. Permaculture has always been much more than a gardening system. It arose from questioning of the 60s and the previous question of the 1890s and the 1930s about uh, why the society, with all its skills and intelligence and resources, keeps falling into holes of its own making. And the word permaculture really uh, was said to be from permanent agriculture, but I always had it in mind but it was from a permanent in culture itself. Instead of concrete and glass, Mollison thinks we should be building with living resources. He says his ideas will work anyway. All you have to do is plant. This is our farm, it's three square metres. That's a considerable addition to our growing area, another couple of square metres. There's also horizontal space under the next veranda up, which is ideal for grapes. No mould, no rain, no mould. In the broad landscape, we try to make ponds and lakes 15% of the total. And in this landscape, we've got about 15% aquaculture, which will fill up and, and plant in highly productive plants as well. Uh, this is the salad sorrel good vitamin C. And lastly, we'll plant some beans to climb up this trellis. These are purple climbers. Then we have a garden fennel. In our aquatic system, we have the ordinary watercress, which is a great sandwich and salad plant and very high in minerals, and the Vietnamese watercress and taro, which we can use Originally, we can, we can cut some of these and use them as spinach, and now we get a root yield. And we can ferment it and make poi and sing Hawaiian songs. All in all, uh, about a fifth of the food for a couple is being produced here. And we have plenty of space left. So uh, I get a lot of fun out of this. It's more fun than uh, chess. And uh, we can put some little fish in here. We could even have frogs here. Uh, we couldn't eat the frogs because you get to know them individually and you can't eat your friends. Most cannibals only eat strangers. 
Okay, so this is the first fruits of the garden. When we first stepped on the planet, we lived by our wits, hunting and gathering. We took our food from the abundance around us and learnt to live with the natural system. But as we began to live in communities, we started to organise nature. Backbreaking work was needed to create harvests of annual crops. Agriculture became the central activity on the planet and its surpluses allowed cities to grow, spawning the industrial age. The machines moved to the farms and people moved to the factories. But with ever-growing urban populations, we needed to expand our arable land. This is the shoe holes. You put a plank in here and you hop up on that. Stand on there, you put an axe cut in here. And you put a shoe there, go around the back, and put a saw cut in and fall the tree. When he was in his early 20s, Mollison was part of the generation that cleared the forests. Globally, since 1940, we have cleared an area the size of North America. It's been three years, I suppose we cut about six to eight houses a day, flooring, and framing, siding boards. Slowly, one day I asked at lunchtime, did any of us own a house? And none of us did. And it occurred to me then that some of us were killing things for the rest of society. And I wondered who was it? Who wasn't building their own houses? And I decided never to cut a tree down unless I needed to cut a tree down. And, and I haven't ever needed to cut a tree down. So it shows you the amount of destruction that you can create when you're thinking about what you're doing, I suppose. The work was totally brutalising and uh, I think I, the most thing I remember about it was we didn't have any time at all to think and it sort of drove you crazy. But the machine promised to put an end to mindless toil and monoculture became the new method of production. It offered a vision of feeding the world with mile upon mile of single crops. Today, over half the world's produce consists of just four easily harvested plants, wheat, rice, maize and potatoes. But we had simplified nature and it started going wrong. We were producing not only single crops, but single pests. The battle began. Exposed to attack, the farmer was forced to defend his fields against the ravages of disease and predators. So, if anything, agriculture, as we know it, have known it since 1940, is really a continuation of the Second World War. Since 1940, 70% of our soils have been destroyed. With all the uh, armaments and chemical manufacturers directing their weapons against nature. 40% of the water of the world has been poisoned by agriculture. A species is lost every six minutes. Nothing on earth is so destructive. If we don't stop agriculture, then we're all dead. In 20 years, there will be one-third the arable land to feed twice as many people. In 1954, Bill became a research assistant for the scientific unit CSIRO, and for nine years lived in the wilderness studying forest ecology. He returned to formal studies in 1966 and was later appointed to the University of Tasmania. 
Over 15 years, he had acquired an immense practical knowledge of forest systems. I looked at the existing forest systems and realized the productivity is hundreds of times greater than man-made agricultural systems. So that I thought we could create forests with components of animals and plants far more suitable for our own use. Productivity would then be higher than a natural forest and our yields would dwarf those of any commercial farm. So uh, it wasn't until 75 or 72 really that I saw the need to activate that sort of thinking and to produce it as something uh, which we call permaculture, but call it what you like. It's an active application of things you observe to systems that you construct. Mm. Well, it's 500 pages. It, it reads very well. I quite <laughs> like it, actually. <laughs> it's uh, not too radical. Bill believed he could construct environments that were as stable as the rainforest. His designs integrate houses, plants and animals into a living system. It begins at the back door. Every zone has a collection of species that regulate each other and needs virtually no maintenance. Every element has many functions. A dam can air condition a house or reflect sunlight to heat sensitive plants. In 1978, he published his manifesto, Permaculture One. Two more have since been added and his works have been translated into seven languages. I wasn't prepared for the rush of inquiries to design farms and it terrified me to go out designing other people's properties so I did it for nothing for a few years some years three years and when I designed two or three hundred farms and the feedback was fairly good I decided I could teach design but up to that point I wouldn't have thought of teaching design land right before our eyes there hasn't produced anything and what will we do with it it's only a matter of which sort of forest we can have it in, we can have it in long-term, high-quality timber. Mollison was prepared to teach anyone who would listen. With the rise of the environmental movement, he found a ready audience. But while most were protesting for the preservation of rainforests, Bill was training his army for the restoration of the land that had been destroyed. Nitrogenous high cover, under which the black passion fruits recede and, and go up. His fight with ideas had begun and forests of food were his final goal. Reinvigorate this back into a faster production. The highest energy... The initial reaction from the teaching establishment was one of shock, horror and opposition. And uh, I could say that the whole of the educational establishment almost rose against me. I was invited to speak to August bodies uh, with the object really of tearing me to pieces. Uh, I was treading across the disciplines. Permaculture always did lie between the disciplines. It's a connecting system between disciplines. But Mollison's ideas kept growing and his band of converts turned to influencing the mainstream. Once a year, every major town holds a show, and the local permaculture group has its stall next to the tractor and pesticide companies. Handing out seedlings and show bags, they hope they'll win the war, but they are up against powerful forces. Agriculture is the cultural and economic backbone of the lucky country. The fair presents a rosy image of rural health and abundance. But the real problem, Mollison says, is that modern agriculture is not a system for producing food, but producing money. In sustaining this wealth, modern agriculture pays no respect to the resources it is based on. No one yet pays for the damage at the end of the chain. 
society's caught up in this system of destruction. Instead of all that, you can grow a garden in a few weeks. They'll provide you with vegetables and timber all your life. And it seems to me to be much more sane and responsible that people should be trained to put in those few weeks of work. This is the thinking man's potato patch. You use a Saturday supplement of the newspaper and you know, turn this information into food. This is the best use for ad advertising, best use for news, bad news. This is going to be good news one day. You can still put straw on a potato, because it will come through, but for other plants, it'll kill them. Digging causes work. Work causes digging. Weeds cause work, digging causes weeds, cause and effect, vicious cycle. The straw mulch imitates the litter of the forest floor. It retains water by stopping evaporation and controls weeds as well. Straw. And this is where the designer uh, turns into a recliner. You can rest in your garden. If you have it already well planted, you can pretend to be working in the garden and be invisible from the house. Part of the total design of the lazy gardener. Over here, uh, young potatoes coming through. It saves a lot of work and in the end, soil. But there are other strategies as well. And then the pigeon pea, which is very good legume. It lasts a few years. Bill thinks planting is a lot easier than weeding. And if you have enough plants in, there's no room for the weeds. So the only work the gardener needs to do is a leisurely stroll, whilst admiring the wonders of nature at work. This is a Cacia fimbriata, which is a very good chicken forage. And this is, a, it's got a lot of good characteristics. It's a cradle area, first of all, it's brittle and it's easy to mulch and then it also is one of the group of legumes that catches uh, nematodes in its roots it has three little uh, cells like this a nematode comes through and it strangles them and eats them all plants are carnivores they eat you in the end Bill expects to do a lot more eating himself before he's eaten by the plants. Coriander, which is another volunteer, we didn't plant it. Celery, some small uh, head cabbages, these small ones are good for a small family. Uh, forming ground cover under the chart, parsley itself here. And then lots and lots of basil, in fact, an embarrassment of basil. Uh, I don't know how regular I started this garden, it will inevitably turn itself into chaos. This untidiness is actually good natural order. Tidiness is maintained disorder. In fact, Mollison's property has been very carefully planned. He moved there less than a year ago and already nature is running rampant. Much of the success is based on his underground plumbing system. He uses what is called a swale the rainwater is trapped, absorbed into the ground, and then sent slowly downhill. Instead of rushing off this property, and we have a drought three days later, all this water is now travelling through the subsoil uh, under the tree system I've put in down there to take it up. And if we do this repeatedly uphill, um, we never have a drought. It's not possible. <coughs> Australia's not a dry continent, it just has 88% of its water runs off or evaporates. So we simply slow up the progress of a resource through the landscape. We're a source like water, and we trap it in soil, we trap it in dams, and make it do its duty. In the engineering term, water has duties to do, and the main duty it has to do for, for us and for total design is to grow plants. What's your garden going to be like in five years? 
Uh, well, it'll be hard to get through. But, and there's a, be a grave danger of being killed by falling fruit, I think. I don't know. I mean, there's going to be hundreds of kilograms of fruit product. I'm not quite sure. I think I'll have to join forces with the pig. Get a friend to help me harvest the system, you know. Convert poor poor into pig. And then I'll have to have a party. Uh, honey. And we'll all celebrate overproduction. Bill expects his garden to grow as dense as this forest. But a forest is more than just trees and plants. It is a home to many animals as well. You can see an animal simply as a mobile part of the forest. It's not something separate from the forest. Pigeons come in, eat the fruits from the top of the forest and take it out to the forest edge and extend the forest. So the pigeons are the the planters and uh, extension system of this forest. Wallaby can't exist without the fungi, the fungi can't exist without the tree, the tree can't exist without the fungi and the wallaby and the karawong. So that's a guild. It's only people who have a very limited education or concept that can separate plant from animal. A factory chicken lives in a wire cage, interreacts with a food machine, and ends in the oven. It's an unfulfilling life. But to Bill, the trauma is not only to the chickens. We miss out when we become separate from animals. He sees our salvation as getting the chickens back home, where they can help us with the garden. Well, poultry, ducks and chickens and geese are very much a part of permaculture system. They have some very essential functions. The chicken in the permaculture garden provides a shredding machine. It provides pest control by eating decayed fruit and the larvae and insects that infest it. And then the garden provides the chicken with all its needs. Shelter, other chickens and uh, its food. And the chicken does nothing that it wouldn't do naturally. In all systems in which we include animals, part of the system, sometimes almost half of the system, can be specifically planted for the animals. And there's a huge energy difference between doing that and feeding a chicken to purchase food. In a chicken factory, it takes nine eggs worth of energy to produce one egg, which leaves eight eggs worth of energy to clear up. So if we're going to keep chickens, we should both satisfy the needs of the chicken and make sure that something in the system uses the outputs of the chicken. So uh, by satisfying its needs, we avoid work. By making sure its outputs are used, we avoid pollution. Pollution is just an unused output of the system. Millions of tons of food arrive every day. And city people really don't have a clue where it comes from. All we do is pay for it. In terms of energy costs, food would be about 95% cheaper. I said 95% if we were grown in the city, because just within the city of New York, we lose about 13% of the food in its distribution phase. But 95% of the cost of that food is in carting it to New York, in packaging the food, and in taking the waste away. Looking around almost every supermarket we enter, it's really hard to believe there's any people hungry in the world or any food crisis. And yet, very little of this food comes from anywhere near the city. And most of it will come from thousands of kilometres away. And a three-day transport strike, and hardly any of us would be here.
Bill's solution is to grow the food where we live. How realistic is it? In a suburban backyard, one of Mollison's early designs is now reaching maturity. The land covers a quarter acre block and the house is a splendid example of his ideas. Here's something in the right place. It's a mouldboard plough. It's rather like hanging up some of the burners out of the ovens at Dachau, a relic of the age of agriculture which is just passing. And while there's plenty of food in this garden, there's no need of plough. There are over 500 species, so that even in winter, there's enough food for all the family and neighbours. Ah, uh, kumquats, fortunella. One of my favourite fruit, I think. Especially after a month or two in brandy and sugar. This is a Japanese parsley. Call these throwover greens. They're all important for the health of chickens. A bath full of Chinese water chestnuts which are delicious. You can buy them in cans, but here you get them fresh and they're always crisp. Nothing like sitting by an Indian pond and watching a lot of very graceful women in saris picking water chestnuts and putting them into brass bowls. It's very sensual. This garden is extremely rich in species and at every time of year something's in flower. Here we have lavender. And dotted throughout the garden are about a dozen homemade beehives so that in winter time you can get considerable cheer from honey mead. But instead of drinking merrily in our gardens, most people prefer to work mowing lawns. Yet Mollison thinks this green cancer is a serious threat. The problem with this agriculture is, although it uses up more resources than what most would think of as agriculture, that is food agriculture, it has no use at all. And the weight up cost is somewhere near four dollars per square foot to maintain them annually. And that doesn't count for the cost of the fuel and the manpower and the labour of maintaining these strange deflection states in the city that nobody really uses. Well, being a good urban gorilla, we might start a revolution by putting a hazelnut in the lawn. People may not use lawns, but they look at them. All the great gardens of history have been neatly designed, carefully sculptured arrangements. Compositions that appeal to our order and aesthetics. We believe in symmetry, and we have built palatial landscapes to overcome our disappointment with nature's chaos. We want to live in a world where nature is tidy, hygienic, and safe. But nature's not worried about aesthetics. It's interested in abundance. Ugly mangrove swamps, for example, are the most productive environment on the planet. We've always been very ambivalent in our approach to mangroves. They're not easily accessible. They're muddy and smell a little bit and they're spiky. The smell is a sign of its fertility. The decomposing organic matter provides the food for the hundreds of fish and crab species that breed within its waters. For years that we've been filling them in, cutting mangroves down, we've been dredging out these streams and turning them into uh, middle-class residential suburbs. The um, high tide mark clearly indicated here on the retaining walls by a black line and that leaves you one or two feet of sea level rise within our projections of the 40-year sea rise all this capital all this effort all these people won't be here because most of this will be sea shallow seas it may be a lot more productive but it's surely going to lay waste a tremendous amount of human effort and resource Everybody has a tuna boat, but in two or three years there won't be any more tuna. And that's a law of stupidity or extinction. It's to turn a highly productive natural system into a high consuming uh, artificial system.
The more you walk around places like this, the more surreal they become. Lawns are giving way to AstroTurf. There's a lot of television sets on in this neighbourhood. I think they might be watching wildlife films. And there are a great many exploration vehicles, four-wheel drives, that will carry you to the wilderness. So it's as though they're chasing something that's just disappearing in front of them all the time. Let's wake up and let's get real. Stop and play and take the wheel. Five billion people with each one seed. Could we plant all the forest in just one week? Plant a garden and plant enough crops to really grow. You do it in your own little space. Daikon. Four billion years on this here globe is a lot of evolution, so I've been told. Highly evolved, though we may be, we need to get a sense of ecology. Montanova, Fukuoka, Bill Morrison, too, with Jackson and people like me and you. We make a difference in the world, we make a sound profound when we pass the word around. Permaculture. She's the queen, cause we're all a part of her living machine. It's up to us, the permaculture crew, to see this madness through and through. Set an example for the world to see. Bring our mother back to harmony. One of the great dangers that we are now facing is that we play around with the genetic base of things. Uh, for instance, a good example is that to prevent uh, strawberry frosting, I think, in California, and it altered the nature of bacterium, Pseudomonas syringae, so that the frost can't settle on the crop, and that's a genetic alteration. The very same bacterium is a very efficient cloud seeding organism, and we may be depending on that bacterium and its allies for rain. So uh, do we risk stopping rain in the whole world to stop frost settling on a California strawberry crop? we should make scientists accountable. At present, they're basically sociopaths. Bill thinks that before manipulating individual genetic components, we should understand their role in the planetary system. Already, we have begun destabilizing global weather patterns, and we know little of how to control it. But our most valuable resources are provided by nature. We think that water is abundant, yet at any one time, only 3% of the water of the planet is fresh, and almost all of it is trapped in ice. The remainder is being continually moved and purified as the sun drives the water cycle. The forests are the major pumps and collectors of this cycle, and trap three quarters of this precious water. For every uh, three inches of this litter, we can absorb one inch of rain. So the, there's a great um, absorbent carpet on the floor. So basically you can look on the rainforest as a tree system or you can look on it as a lake. transpires water to the air and rehumidifies that air. It's therefore a cloud generator. And then the forest gives off bacterial colonies to the airstream. And these are the ice nuclei from the clouds. So the forest, in every real sense, creates its own rainfall. The forest will create five or six hundred percent more rainfall than a non-forested landscape. So the river and the forest uh, have a constant interdependence. The river in the whole forest is as the sap is in the whole tree. And uh, the river takes nutrients both ways. The fish swim up and the phosphate from the fish can flash out into this forest through birds and animals. And the forest gives leaf material to the river. So if we clear this forest in this climate for agriculture, we don't have, we have maybe 14% of the nutrient of the total system in the soil. And we lose the soil, we lose the nutrient, we lose the game. In many parts of the world, the game is already lost. 
Haiti has no soil. It's down to bare rock. Famines in Ethiopia are caused by a drop in agricultural productivity of over 4,000%. Much of the world's forests are being logged and sold to the wealthy nations. Living on barren land, the local population is forced to destroy the few remaining resources just to survive to the end of the week. It's certainly possible for us to extend forests over enormous areas that we have cleared historically or destroyed. And that's probably the only job that we have left on Earth that is, uh, can express our humanity, is to return other species to their place and uh, take our place, which is a small place in the total system. On a farm in southern Queensland, this process has already started. Once overgrazed and eroded, the property is becoming commercially viable again through the broad-scale permaculture system it has installed. It produces not only a fruit harvest, but also rare timbers lost from generations of logging. The land is dotted with ponds and waterways, and within them an aquaculture has been installed. Native species coexist with commercial crops. The pond life is just part of the thousands of species that are being introduced to the property. The rainforests are being replanted and the wildlife they attract will add to its fertility. The design here is to plant these small palms and ferns so that this will become a very broad corridor. Already some of the rainforest birds like the megapodes, the scrub turkeys, are moving in here. It's within these cool and shaded areas that the traffic of wildlife occurs. You can smell water rat along the river. There's flocks of honey eaters going through the canopy overhead. And every so often a forest wood pigeon comes down. Wallaby are on the slope and they'll soon be moving along these corridors through the whole system of this forest farm. And for us it's an incredible difference to be sitting in here, cool and shady. And it's so hot outside in the field. It's kind of like the end game in any, in, any arid land. Yeah, yeah, last act is the goats, right. Yeah, we see you go. goats, you know, in the end of it. Increasingly, Mollison has been drawn to the front line of environmental problems, the third world, where he works with local permaculture organisations. Many cultures, such as most of the Indian subcontinent and Africa, went directly from hunter-gatherer society to agriculture, and agriculture is perhaps the final desertification of those continents. The causes of famine and want in those societies are because they didn't have this gardening instruction, and they didn't make that gradation from hunter-gatherers to gardeners. When I returned after finishing my college, um, I got into working with the mainstream agriculture thing and without realizing the fact what I was doing. When I heard about Bill Mollison and his work, I read his books, and I felt that I was not doing justice to myself and to the country and to the people. So we started the farm with the idea to do something with the people, learn from them and uh, show them to build on what they have already. So uh, in a nutshell I could say it's only a teaching tool to show them that they have the resources. What we need is to place them together, put things in the right place. We need a little input from outside in terms of finance and uh, at times with the little inputs of information where uh, we could do things ourselves. Our own people could do it. Mollison has influenced projects in Africa, Asia and Latin America. While many would see this as a charitable aid program, Bill believes that these projects are models that the first world will need when the crunch comes for us. What counts in Nepal and India is that they have years of ground experience and history and tradition to draw. 
And it's time to get these highly skilled and experienced people uh, to the first world, where they can teach people how to look after themselves, how to feed themselves, how to save energy. Most permaculture designers have already learnt these skills. Max Lindegger is the architect of Crystal Waters, an entire community planned along permaculture lines. With a capital of $8 million, he expects it to be a model for building communities with a future. Well, we uh, have always aimed to become developers. And this is the first uh, active development, large-scale development, in which we've been involved. And we think we can do it much better than developers do. Or we will do it much better than developers. We've already provided water systems. All the houses here will self-provide for energy. We'll have mains energy only for uh, uh, semi-industrial endeavours. And all the agricultural land has been set aside for agriculture and the forestry land for forestry. And we're not obliterating our basic resources. When we first proposed permaculture in 1975, only one existed in my backyard. Today there are thousands, and for all I know, hundreds of thousands. I find it quite remarkable to travel from a very small fishing village in Tasmania, where I lived for some time while I was developing permaculture, and go to somewhere like Nepal and find somebody has been influenced by and has created permaculture in Nepal. And the feeling I get is one of immense feeling of gratitude, because it's something that I personally don't have to do. It's time to stop fiddling about and regarding this as a, a peripheral activity, things like permaculture, calling it an alternative activity, calling it names in effect. And so this has to be the mainstream agriculture of any future society and that all investment should be swung to those ends now. 600 billion, about 600 billion dollars in ethical funds. It's time to match up the will of the public to invest ethically in projects. Because even if you're an investor, even if you're making lots of money on the stock market in agrochemicals, you're also made out of meat and so are your family. And as an African said to me once, if God hadn't intended us to eat people, he wouldn't have made them out of meat. Bill contemplates cannibalism with a sparkle in his eye. Yet there's no doubt present trends are bad. Perhaps mainstream technology will breathe life back into our frail human structures, but a solution is needed before our window on the world is closed forever. Mollison is offering paradise. Well, we're in the Garden of Eden. Uh, this is a garden that was planted by this Gahan Gilfeder about six and seven years ago. He left it about three years ago. And since then, it's had practically zero maintenance. But I'm surrounded by a great variety of perennial food and self-seeding food. It's another sort of jungle that was originally Avocados at head level, avocados at ground level, and then Mandarins, some danger in extensive places here of getting lost. But if you do get lost, there's plenty to eat, that's the point. This is one of the very few sites in the subtropics which was originally well designed and planted. So all in all, I think when Gahan set this up, he set it up to do this, and it's done it. And people say to me, will permaculture work? I say to them, will plants grow? <laughs>